Hello and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. We've got an exciting topic about a nutrient that's symbolized by the letter B. That doesn't mean boring, it means boron, which is a very important nutrient. We'll talk about why it's so important to your crop on today's show. Well, another thing I don't find boring is getting high yields. Well, it's harder to do if you're taking ground out of CRP, or maybe you just had some prevent plant here over the last year. We're gonna talk about how you take those fields and make them great this coming year. We've got a tough to control weed of the week that if you get this thing out of your field, your fields will be much better. I don't know if they'll be great necessarily, but they'll at least be much better. But first, here's our Farm Basics. Your soybeans are in the bin, but the game isn't over yet. Score more points this year by taking your beans to the end zone. At $10 Beans, every point of moisture below your target takes away 15 cents per bushel. Reclaim that lost yield with the end zone bin system from Farm Shop MFG. Today during our Farm Basics time, we're going to talk about fences. Let's start with weeds and how we get those weeds under control if there are fence lines around your property. Well, you notice a lot of things with fences where some areas they're mowed underneath them, some they're kind of weedy and just left to go. I like to leave the grass growing through the fence line because that's going to hold weeds down long term. Some people like to see it just completely black underneath the fence line. So your options for controlling the weeds are totally different. If you don't mind that, hey, I want it to be completely black under the fence line, you may use Roundup to kill everything. You may also use a ground sterilant if you feel you can get away with that and keep that ground completely weed free for a long period of time. Yep, so we used to do a lot of that around our farm, and then what we discovered is if you don't stay up with that, that's where weeds grow. Instead of having grass grow there, now you have weeds. The other thing is you have more erosion out of there. So I didn't like either of those things, so we've kind of gone away from that, and we just end up spraying usually 2,4-D or dicamba in that fence line, depending on the crop that we're raising right next to it. Now, if you're driving down the road and you say, well, okay, I get that, there's fence line here, but the next field, there's no fences, what's <laughs> yep. going on there? Okay, so when Darren and I were young, we had livestock around the farm, and what we'd do is we'd turn our cattle out onto corn stalks, like we're standing in right now, so they could scavenge around and eat whatever was left out there. Well, now, we don't raise livestock ourselves. So we've actually taken all the fences out because it makes the farming and the weed control just a little bit easier. But every once in a while, you run into a situation like we bought some ground a few years ago, and the neighbor said, yeah, I'd like to put cattle out on my field here, and and so we need to fence it there and you have to pay half the cost. And I go, wait, wh what? I don't want cattle. I have to pay half the cost? Yep, that's the rule in a lot of states. It's a fence in, fence out rule. So you just have to check on what is the rule for your state. Maybe it's for your county or your township or your city. But where we are in South Dakota, it's a fence in, fence out rule. So I'm actually required to pay for half that fence if the neighbor wants to have livestock there. So it keeps the livestock off my property. And certainly there's a lot of areas where there are no fences because neither neighbor has any livestock and they just don't want to have to deal with the weeds or the grass under the fence. And so they pulled the fence out to make it a little easier with equipment and everything else. There's just a lot of reasons for why there are fences in some places and not fences in others. Well, we've talked about weed control a little bit on this show already, but we've got our Weed of the Week coming up later in the show. Can you identify this week's weed? My name is Amos Smith. I'm a fourth generation dairy farmer in Western New York. We considered strip till about three years ago. We usually have a wider harvest window because we're not compacting the soil and we're not uh, faced with too mellow a soil in the fall. The soils are a lot healthier. The machine, you know, it's, it's definitely rugged. It's a great system overall. It's a good fit for our operation. How much does your crop residue cost you? Over time, residue accumulates in your field, building excess carbon levels and tying up your plant available nitrogen. Residue also traps P, K, and micros and can take years to naturally become available to your crops. This is because soil lacks the diverse microbial life needed to break it all down. With Decomp, you can naturally restore life to your soils and allow the release of valuable crop fertility. Learn more at heftyseed.com naturals. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation. 
how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy. All the way down to the last drop. Agroliquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. Pentair Hypro Ultra Low Drift Nozzles are your ideal choice for the Enlist E3 herbicide system. With coverage comparable to flat fans and with 90% less drift, ULD nozzles meet all required standards for Enlist applications and provide optimal performance of contact herbicides. Learn more at pentair.com slash hypro. When you apply phosphate fertilizer, it binds to calcium in the soil, becoming calcium phosphate, essentially tooth enamel. How much of this tooth do you think will become available to your crop? NutriCharge doubles your phosphate availability by protecting it from calcium fixation. What I look for in a seed isn't just in the seed. It's people I trust who get me the solve without the cell. Who show me where their seed fits and even where it doesn't. Because the only innovation that matters is the one I need. With NK Seeds, progress means pushing my potential. And success matters. One of the most important nutrients for your crop that you may never have even used is boron. We're going to talk a little about boron, what you should look for in the soil test, and how you can fertilize with boron for your crop. First of all, I'll say this. I don't think that boron is the number one yield limiting factor on many farms. I will say this though, that once you get nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur taken care of, all of a sudden some of the micronutrients like boron could end up being your yield limiting factor. So I just encourage do some good soil testing either this fall or next spring on your farm to learn what nutrients are really important and then make sure you're doing a complete test to look at things like boron because this is one that we are seeing low to deficient on many, many farms. What we're looking for most of the time is about two to three parts per million on boron for decent yielding crops. Unfortunately, Darren and I look at soil tests almost every day from farmers all over the United States and Canada, and we see boron very, very rarely ever at two parts per million for two main reasons. Number one, boron is leachable. Now, it's not nearly as leachable as nitrate or sulfate. They say that nitrate is roughly twice as leachable as sulfate, but boron is way less leachable than both. So I am not super worried about it unless you have sand and you have lots of rainfall. But anyway, the other reason why boron shows up so low on soil tests quite often is most people don't apply a whole lot. Now, it doesn't take a lot of boron to get yourself up to two parts per million if, let's say, you're at a half a part per million today, but absolutely be looking at that on your soil test. One of the big reasons that I think that many people don't apply boron is because they're getting bad information and they're hearing, you know what, boron can be toxic. Well, sure, everything can be toxic at too high a rate. You can have too much water and kill your crop, right? But how many times were we praying for another rainfall? Boron is kind of like that. We need some boron out there. And yes, if you put a million pounds of boron out, of course, it's going to wipe out the crop. So here's where I think the discussion should start, Brian, because frankly, we've applied some pretty high rates of boron on our farm. Yeah, we've applied three, four, maybe even a little more pounds than that per acre. You think about that, three or four pounds per acre in one application, a lot of people would say, you're nuts, that's way too much. You're going to hurt the crop. Well, look, the number one thing that safens boron is good levels of calcium. So as long as your calcium percentage on your base saturation test is above 65%, you're usually pretty good. The other thing you can look at is how heavy is my soil? If your cation exchange capacity is above 10 or 15, you're usually pretty good applying a pound or two pounds of boron. Like in our case, we did experiments for years trying, okay, how far can we push this based on heavy soil, high calcium levels, and we found we can actually put a lot of boron on. How we typically do it is with dry in the fall. And the reason why we like dry, it's roughly one-tenth the cost of liquid. But the problem with it is we want to go out and broadcast, so we're not going to recover all of it this year, and we certainly have the chance for losing it if it would happen to be light soil with lots of rain. So I agree with Brian, the liquid is going to be more expensive than the dry, but there is a place for liquid boron as well in your program. If you've got a growing crop and you can feed it 
foliar to try to push some boron in and get an immediate impact, hey, that's the way to go. The liquid boron can be used at low rates and there are lots of products and there's tons of experience with many growers all over the world doing this in different crops. And the timing on boron is one that I think is a little confusing for people too, because many say, well, this is important in the reproductive stages of growth with many plants. I'll agree with that, but you do need some boron all the way through the season. So putting some out there early, as Brian was suggesting that we do on our farm with the soil applied boron application, that's good because now we can get a little bit of boron in that plant all the way through the year. Okay, so let me step you back through why we have ended up doing a bunch of dry in our farm. We've identified that boron's been at least somewhat of a limiting factor for us. We've been really short on boron for years and years. And we've tried a number of different things, especially putting it on with the planter in a liquid fashion. Well, then it got to the point where we're doing tissue analysis and we're realizing we're deficient, deficient, deficient. We're thinking, okay, well, let's put some foliar boron on. And in order to get a good response, we're spending 10 bucks and in some cases, 20 bucks. And I go, oh my goodness, if we're gonna spend 20 bucks, think about that at $3 corn. I, I mean, just to pay that back, I gotta have seven bushels and it, I want it to really, truly pay. So I probably have to have a 10 or 15 bushel gain. And we simply weren't getting that. We were getting some gain, but not that. So we just thought, okay, how can we cut the cost down? Let's try the dry since it costs so much less. And we'll put that on the soil in the fall. And hopefully then there's enough in the spring to get us by. Now our levels have gone up. I still don't think we have our levels up as high as we need them to be, but at least our tissue levels have certainly gotten better on our farm and we didn't have to spend a zillion dollars. Brian mentioned that nitrogen and sulfur and boron can all be in leachable forms out in your fields. Oftentimes we see farmers applying them at the same time since they will move with moisture through your soil. They could certainly be used in a side dress or a wide drop type application to still deliver them to your plant. And here's the other thing all three of those nutrients kind of work together in the plant. They're all involved with getting that nitrogen to the right place at the right time in your crop. So boron is certainly important in how nitrogen is utilized in your plant. And obviously nitrogen is a big part in yield. One last thing I'll throw out, there are some farmers out there who will throw just a little bit of boron in with every application they make. Now, I don't know if that's the way to go or not, but what I'm saying is if you're out there spraying four times during the season for weeds, for bugs, for diseases, all that kind of thing, and if you threw in just a little bit of boron each time, could that possibly help? Sure, it could. And if you do tiny little doses, I don't mind it so much, but again, I do have a big issue with, I'm gonna spend $20 and I'm only gonna gain three or four bushels of corn. That simply does not pay. We've always gotta figure out what are the economics and we have to make money. Getting the right plant food mix out there for your crop is very important, and so is weed control. Can you identify this week's Weed of the Week? Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you want, in your life and on your farm, Case IH AFS Connect gives you more control. Monitor your operation, manage your fleet and your farm data your way. Case IH, rethink productivity. YieldTrack has tracks in its DNA. I have with me Matt Meyer, lead YieldTrack planner engineer from Norwood Sales. Matt, what makes these tracks so special? Well, Bill, these tracks were designed with a spherical bearing as the main pivot that allows oscillation, camber, and steering from a single mechanism. The design has five degrees of camber to match the crown of the road, resulting in a faster and cooler road transport. Yield track then uniquely locks out this camber in the field to maximize the belt-soil contact ratio, improving flotation while minimizing both belt wear and soil compaction. Finally, we add an infield steering option for those who need auto guidance, especially those doing strip till, making this track system unmatched in the industry. Well, thank you, Matt. You can only get these tracks on a yield track planner. Call Norwood Sales for more information. Across the country and across county lines, no two operations are alike. You make the right decisions for the right acres, and no decision is more important than what you choose to plant. Introducing Extend Flex Soybeans, 
Elite Genetics, now with the addition of glufosinate tolerance, giving you the yield you want with the choice you need. Extend Flex Soybeans. prevent plant this year, one of your biggest concerns has got to be how do I make my yields great next year. We'll also talk today about CRP. If you're going to take ground out of CRP and put it into cropland, what do you do? So we'll talk through those things. One of my first questions when I talk to anybody with prevent plant ground or CRP ground is what plants are actually growing out in the field? Chances are we've got perennials that we've got to deal with or just some really tough, well-established plants with deep root systems. And my next question would be, how long has it been in CRP or how long has it been in prevent plant? Because if you've had something that's gotten established, like for example, Canada thistle, if you've got some Canada thistle starting and it's the first year, not as big a problem, not as tough to control as Canada thistle. It's been there for 10 years. Now all of a sudden I know we've got extensive rhizomes to deal with. Okay, so usually if it's CRP or prevent plant, we would tell you kill everything off in the fall. The reason why is if you kill it now, then winter kill has a chance to finish the rest of it off. And then in the spring, you have a lot fewer weeds to deal with. Now certainly if you put a cover crop out there, let's say, which you could technically call CRP a cover crop, you might say, well, I want it growing through the winter. You can do that. I'm not saying you can't. It's just that now it's going to rob water and nutrients out of the soil early in the spring and the problem with that is in a dry year like for us and where we farm we're short on moisture quite often so I don't want to be more short on moisture because I let something grow into the spring if you're in an area that gets 60 inches of rain as opposed to our 20 inches of rain you may feel different you go hey I want to remove some water great leave it growing all the way until early spring but as soon as you possibly can get out there with a huge rate of roundup but then on top of that if there are some weeds that that are out in that field that are Roundup resistant, you may have to throw something else in, whether that's dicamba or 2,4-D or something else. All depends on what crop you're going to go to and what weeds they are. But I'm just saying, make sure you get great weed control. The other thing I think about, especially in the situation of prevent plant ground, why was it prevent plant? Well, because it was too wet and it needs some drainage improvements. Here is a great time to get that done. You're well ahead of when you're going to plant next spring get that drainage tile project taken care of out in that field so it doesn't go prevent plant again because the last thing you want to do is invest a bunch of time, money, and effort into getting that ground back into production only to have it drown out again and go back into prevent plant down the road. Well, let's face it, Darren, CRP, a lot of, in our area, ground got put into CRP because it was too wet to farm because guys were having troubles there. With ground that's been CRP for a while, Hopefully organic matter has built up in that soil and it's now pretty good soil, but that doesn't fix the drainage issue. So if you've got a drainage issue, yes, take care of that. Next, really take a look at what do I have for fertility out here. In the CRP, you might be thinking, oh, there's gotta be lots of fertility out there. Well, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, I don't know. Same thing with prevent plant, make sure you're soil testing. The last thing I'll say is make sure you've got good microbial life in that soil. So coming out of CRP, you should have good microbial life, except for you haven't had soybeans out there for a long time or a legume. My point is, if you're gonna go to alfalfa, you're gonna go to soybeans, you're gonna go to some legume crop, make sure you're using inoculant. If it's prevent plant ground, then you might wanna look at mycorrhiza fungi. Add some MycoApply Endoprime, for example, in the spring. Add some other biological or natural products to help get that microbial life really going again because without good microbial life, you can't raise the best crop possible. The last question that I've got, especially for CRP ground, since it's been in CRP for a long period of time, sometimes people will use products with extremely long soil residual, like Tordon or Milestone in those situations to go after thistles or other tough weeds. If you haven't had control of that ground, 
make sure you're checking with the previous owner or the previous tenant for that land. What have you sprayed out there? Is there anything that could potentially carry over? We've seen it too many times where CRP ground has come out, a farmer plants soybeans and they die because there happened to be tordon or something else lingering in the soil. Well, our Weed of the Week might not be the biggest problem in CRP or prevent plant ground, but it could be an issue on your farm. We'll talk about how to stop it coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift and near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? Weed of the week is crabgrass. Crabgrass is one of my least favorite weeds because it ruins my summer. It pops up in my yard and it's right when I want to enjoy things and it just doesn't look good out there. And then if my yard dries out, Brian, crabgrass keeps growing and I still have to mow. Okay. I don't like it. Well, it's one of these things where you say, is this a weed or is it not a weed? And if you don't care what your lawn looks like, if it has crabgrass out there, what's the difference? If it has crabgrass or bluegrass, it's got grass. You just wanted a grass lawn, you got a grass lawn. But anyway, if you're trying to get rid of crabgrass, here's the problem. It is a warm season grass. A lot of the grasses that are in lawns in our region are cool season grasses like Kentucky bluegrass. So to Darren point when it gets to be 100 degrees and dry in the middle of the summer the crabgrass is going to grow the bluegrass is not well the other thing is it gets started a little later so a lot of times we'll see people put out a weed and feed type application where they're controlling early season weeds but that wears off before the crabgrass gets started which normally happens about the time the lilacs are blooming in our geography it takes about the same amount of heat to make those two things happen so you need to come back in with an application of quinclorac which is going to take care of the crabgrass as it's just starting to germinate and it's also going to take care of some of the clovers and other weeds that you've got yep there are a lot of people that will use pendimethalin early in the season that would be like prowl for example that we use in soybeans and speaking of that if i go to soybeans i want to use one of the yellow put a yellow down that's going to make a lot of difference the yellows like trifluralin and prowl are way better than the group 15s that you would typically use in corn or early post-emerge in soybeans by group 15s i mean outlook warrant dual harness surpass zidua all of those fortunately in row crops tillage helps with crabgrass post-emerge applications of roundup or liberty can wipe out crabgrass there's a lot of choices in crop it's just in lawns, there aren't a whole lot of choices. So again, you can go with pendimethalin when that grass is dormant, or you can come back in with quinclorac over the top. Well, that's it for our Weed of the Week, but stay tuned, Iron Talk is coming up next. Each year brings new and unique challenges to farming, and your operation needs to constantly adapt to meet them. That's why at Ag Biome, we're working every day to bring you new and better solutions. Microbial-based solutions that protect your crop and help it reach its full potential. To learn more about how we're doing it, visit agbiome.com. Ag Biome, feeding the world responsibly. Partnering with microbes for human benefit. Who says harvest should be the only rewarding part of the season? Sure, ending a successful year of planning and planting is a very gratifying moment. But with the Bayer Plus Rewards program on your side, it doesn't have to be the only one. By helping you earn and redeem cash back on seed, herbicides, and other eligible products you use throughout the entire season, you can reap the benefits all year round. So contact your retailer to learn how to get more from your crops and put more in your wallet. Bayer Plus. Rewards are always in season.
Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy. All the way down to the last drop. Agroliquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. My name is Amos Smith. I'm a fourth generation dairy farmer in Western New York. We considered strip till about three years ago. We usually have a wider harvest window because we're not compacting the soil and we're not uh, faced with too mellow a soil in the fall. The soils are a lot healthier. The machine, you know, it's, it's definitely rugged. It's a great system overall. It's a good fit for our operation. Your soybeans are in the bin, but the game isn't over yet. Score more points this year by taking your beans to the end zone. If your beans went in the bin at low moisture, you can naturally rehydrate to reclaim lost yield with the end zone fan control system from Farm Shop MFG. At $10 beans, every point of moisture below your target takes away 15 cents per bushel. That means raising 9% moisture beans to 13 can increase your profits by 60 cents per bushel. Score more yields in the end zone from Farm Shop MFG. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you want, in your life and on your farm, Case IH AFS Connect gives you more control. Monitor your operation, manage your fleet and your farm data your way. Case IH, rethink productivity. Fertilizer applications are just one of the late season jobs for many farms across the country and the topic of today's Iron Talk. Fall fertilization is great because you give dry fertilizer products like MAP and DAP more time to break down. It's also nice to get one job out of the way so in the spring you have less things in your way before planting. It's my contention though that many farm operations are actually wasting money on fertilizer right now and that means there's an opportunity to get a better return on your fertilizer investment dollar. Here are a few things that you should consider. First, fall urea is a bad idea. I understand you want to get things done now, but urea is not the best form of nitrogen to use when you've got months before you'll plant corn or spring wheat and the possibility of heavy snow or rain between now and then exists. Anhydrous or ammonium sulfate would be better options if you just have to put out nitrogen now. Otherwise, wait until spring to save yourself the 10, 20, maybe even 60% of the product that you will lose by putting it out now. Second, banding fertilizer is much more efficient than broadcasting especially if you have high calcium and high pH soils. Nutrient tie-up is a real thing. For example, when calcium ties up phosphorus, it becomes insoluble in water and may never come available for a future crop. By banding, you keep the nutrients concentrated so they naturally resist tie-up. Third, deep placement is much better than shallow incorporation or, worse yet, leaving nutrients on the soil surface. We prefer to use a knife to put our PNK down 10 inches deep where they're safe and available for our crop all throughout the growing season. Fall fertilization is always going to happen, and it's not a bad thing. Just pick the right products and use the proper equipment to be efficient and environmentally friendly. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. That's all the time we have for today's show, but before we go, we'd encourage you to check out the Ag PhD radio show. You'll find us on Sirius XM channel 147 at 2 p.m. Central each weekday. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.